Could you please? Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Um, we have just uh, one, one and a half announcement. So the half announcement is that we have our men's prayer breakfast uh, coming up this Saturday. Uh, and it's going to be at 8 o'clock here at the church. And so we have a good time there opening up the word and talking about uh, various topics that affect men. And, uh, and we share, eat, eat some kolaches, and just uh, really just get into to men's issues. Um, so it's a good time of encouragement and blessing. If you're a man, please uh, plan to join us this Saturday. Uh, before I get into the other announcement, are, does anybody else have anything that they want to share with the body? Okay, um, if not, and it appears not, then I do have one other thing. Um, there is uh, someone in our midst, um, again, that has added an entirely new digit to their age. And it is not often that digits get added to your age. Um, Pastor Dan has done that recently, but, but rarely do we see... <laughs> That that, <laughs> that that happens, right? And so we are going from a single-digit age to a double-digit age. Um, and Clinton Allison is turning 10 today, 10 <laughs> years old. So Clinton, Clinton, I found out about this two weeks ago, and I've been warming up. I slept with a heating pad on my throat all morning uh, just for this time, Clinton. For you. So, church, would you please join me in uh, celebrating it? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Clinton. Happy birthday to you. Okay, let's, uh, let's open up in prayer, and then we'll get to our catechism question. Father in heaven, we do thank you, Lord, for this time that we can uh, come before you and stand in your midst and gather here uh, in your presence, Father. And we come with burdens, we come with struggles, and we come with a victory in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we just pray that you would continue to work in our lives and continue to conform us more to the image of your son. Help us to learn today. Help us to encourage one another, help us to develop a new friendship today. Father, we do love you. We thank you for the uh, blessings and the grace that you shower upon us each and every day. We do not deserve them, Father, but you are so gracious that you do them nevertheless. So we thank you for this time. We do not take it for granted, and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Church, we are in the Heidelberg Catechism. We're at question number 33. Does anybody have the question memorized. Okay, let's bring up the question first off in church together. Why is Christ called the only begotten Son of God, since we are also the children of God? And together the answer? Because Christ alone is the eternal and natural Son of God, but we are children adopted of God by grace for his sake. Amen. Please stand up. Let's worship God in song. There's a reason to sing today. There's a reason to thank you for my life. This world is a broken place. But I know you have made me for this time. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I'll be glad in it. This is the day. Lord has made, I will rejoice and I'll be glad in it. Your hand is in everything, your kingdom is tearing kingdoms down, 
Your power is conquering. Your mercy is healing even now. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I'll be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I'll be glad in it.
you rose, the grave and death are conquered. You broke my bonds of sin and shame. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, may all my days bring glory to your name. May all my days bring glory to your name.
Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. turns his face away has wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the Upon his shoulders, my name I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was. breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Church, we're going to have a time of prayer now, and so I just ask that you take the next several moments and go before our Father in Heaven, and you can pray by yourself, or you can pray as a family, or you can pray with other families. You can get up and spread out all over these rooms if you like, uh, but we're going to take several minutes and just pray. Uh, Pastor Dan and myself will be up front. If any of you would like uh, to pray with either one of us, we love to do that. We cherish that opportunity. Don't hesitate. Please don't hesitate to come forward and pray with us. Uh, we're available and desirous to do so. And then after several minutes, uh, I'll close this corporately in prayer. Thanks. Never seen it before.
Heavenly Father, we just ask that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts might be pleasing in your sight this morning, Lord, for you're our rock and you're our redeemer. Father, be with Pastor Dan as he comes now. Give him the strength, the endurance, the perseverance, Father, to communicate the message that you've placed upon his heart and give us and the congregation ears to hear and a heart of faith, Father, to receive truth and apply it to our lives so that you might be glorified by conforming more, each of us more to the image of your son. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask and pray these things. Amen. Good morning, church. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. And we will be looking at verse 17 today. And we arrive at, at long last, 10 weeks later at the end of the, the Ten Commandments, and we ho I hope that you have enjoyed um, our time in the Ten Commandments. I have. I know that it can be challenging sometimes um, personally, and I hope that you were challenged um, to, you know, uh, to, to just do one better for God uh, during this time. Um, I know that I have been many times during the course of study. There was a couple of times on Monday morning I was like, Lord, I, I don't want to do this. <laughs> Just put, take me out, coach. I'm not ready to play. <laughs> but uh, God is faithful, certainly. Probably one of my all-time favorite quotes from literature is the one where Charles Dickens describes Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. I have read it to you before, but it's just so... So magical, I, I need to read it to you again. It says, Dickens writes, Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone Scrooge. A, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, and made his eyes red. His thin lips blew and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head, on his eyebrows, his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about him. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. Nobody writes that like that anymore, do they? <laughs> it's exceptional. And Dickens has painted a clear physical picture of someone who is covetous. It's as if it affects his entire being, doesn't it? When someone asked Nelson Rockefeller, a billionaire, how much money it takes to be happy, Rockefeller replied, just a little bit more. Our sinful hearts will never be truly satisfied with things, will they? But in general, we can't help ourselves. We have to find that out for ourselves, don't we? we and so we spend and we are dissatisfied and we wish things were different for us. Well, today we're going to talk about what those desires are, where they come from, and how to live a life that hopefully avoids those traps Let's look together at our verse for today, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now bear in mind as we begin today, I want to make it clear it's not wrong to own nice things. That's okay. It's not wrong to desire certain things. It's when those desires sort of take us over. It's when it's all that we think about. It's all that fills our thoughts any given day that it becomes sinful. The other key here is that we are prohibited from desiring anything that belongs to someone else. 
You see here the prohibition against desiring what belongs to our neighbor. Anything that belongs to our neighbor is off limits to us in terms of desiring to have it for ourselves instead of them owning it. That's the key here. And remember we told you last week that Jesus also told us everyone is our neighbor. Now, what does it mean exactly when we say don't covet? What is covetousness? It's to crave, to yearn for, to deeply desire something that belongs to someone else. One writer calls it a consuming desire. It consumes us. It takes our time. It takes our attention away from more needful things. If you spend all of your time daydreaming about having that new iPhone 14, or even more grievous, not just owning it, but owning Susie's iPhone 14, you don't want just one of your own, you want hers. Well, then you're in sin. A Puritan, Thomas Watson, calls this an insatiable desire of getting the world. He means, of course, by this, getting anything that the world has to offer. Those Puritans, they can be irritating, right? <laughs> they seem to be able to hone in on the exact desires of our heart that's sinful. I wish sometimes they'd just mind their own business. <laughs> Another commentator describes it as uh, an inordinate, ungoverned, selfish desire for something. This lack of governance is key for us. We can desire nice things about without being rather sinful about it. When it comes, when it becomes ungoverned, when we find that all of our time and all of our attention is being devoted to the pursuit of something, well, then that desire is out of hand. Now, not all desires are selfish desires. The, keep in mind, the desire for food motivates us to eat, and that's critical at times. Our desire to do something useful with our lives motivates us to work. We should work, and we should desire to be useful. Our desire for friendship and community can draw our hearts to a certain church, certain people group, perhaps neighbors. Our desire for intimacy can drive us to get married. So there are good and godly desires that exist within us. As has been the case with all of the commandments, the Westminster Catechism has been very insightful. I think about when exactly these things become sinful for us. Question uh, number 81 says the, the answer to it. Rather, the Tenth Commandment forbids all discontentment with our own estate, envying or grieving at the good of our neighbor, and all inordinate motions and affections to anything that is his. And they always give a scripture with the catechism that goes along with these questions. That's what's so good, I believe, about the Westminster and the Heidelberg is they are steeped in Scripture. They are, the answers are grounded there. James 3 is given for this question 81. It says, but if you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, Demonic, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Now, James goes on in chapter 4 to describe this as passions that are at war within us. There are just so many things that we can covet in our lives. The Tenth Commandment mentions various forms of property such as animals and houses and servants. Uh, I think these days we'd find that most people don't covet your horse, although rope does have some pretty good-looking horses, I must admit. I'll be honest. Most of the time it's a bigger house, a faster car, 
better environment or, or better uh, environment for your kids, uh, getting to go to a private school perhaps, better entertainment of various kinds. If the neighbor has a big home theater set up, you want that home theater set up. If they've got a big nice pool, we wish we had that pool. Designer clothes and fancy appliances catch our eyes. We have to have the best designer cologne to put on our body and the best eyeshadow for our pretty little eyelids, right? Madison Avenue, a group of folks in New York City have one function on this earth. They're tasked with creating desire for products in human beings. They're the advertising guys and gals that create ad campaigns that will catch our eye. They will make us want what they're selling. And they're good at it, let me tell you. I see Matthew McConaughey driving that Lincoln. Man, I want a Lincoln a real bad, you know. And those things are junk. I've had one. <laughs> They'll create an ad that, that tells you that only a select few will be able to afford what they're selling or be able to, to get it before it all sells out. This urgency that happens. Tyranny of the urgent. We call it chasing the American dream. And the Bible calls it covetousness. Things, material things, are not all that we desire, one of the deadliest desires is in coveting the spouse of another person. They may look physically a certain way that you end up desiring. They, they may have certain personality traits that make them cute and winsome and desirable. Any attribute of another person's spouse that would make you desire them above your spouse is covetousness. And it's an especially dangerous type of covetousness. It can ruin a marriage. It can ruin the trust that has been built in a marriage. It has certainly ruined many men where it regards ministry both now and in the past. I'm afraid the list of guys who have fallen prey to the sin of covetousness reads like a who's who of professional Christians these days. I think what is so insidious about this sin, the sin of covetousness, is often so easily minimized in Christian circles. We will go a long way down the road with someone before we categorize what they're doing as covetousness. We're tempted to minimize this sin. We say, is it really that big of a deal? Are our desires really that out of whack sometimes? Are we really that sinful? We should not minimize this sin. Jesus listed this sin in Mark 7 along with theft and murder and adultery. It's that serious. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, covetous people will not inherit the kingdom of God. One of the reasons it's so dangerous in and of itself is because it can cause a litany of other sins. At first, you merely plot how to get something. You know, King David thought about Bathsheba. He looked and he thought. It was merely thoughts at first, and then he invited her up to the palace. And he took action on what he was thinking about, and then he took her for himself, which is adultery, and then he tried to cover it up with the treachery of having her husband come home to hide his sin. And then he put him on the front lines of battle, and David was then guilty of murder. His actions became more and more sinful as he went because of that root sin of covetousness. That's how a sinful action always occurs. It starts with our sinful desire. James, again, tells us in chapter 1, he says, But each one is tempted when he is carried away, and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So what it all really boils down to is that this is a condition of the heart. We should ask ourselves, when tempted with things 
or relationships that might not glorify God? What does my heart desire? Where will that desire lead me in the end? That is what sets, I believe, the Tenth Commandment apart from the others in terms of importance. It's, it's hugely important as well as the difficulty that we might have in avoiding the temptation to break it. It begins as a matter of the heart. All of this begins inside of us. Where the other sins involve actions, murder, stealing, lying, being disobedient to parents and authority, covetousness begins inside of us in our hearts. And, and this is where it can get really hard for us. We get this list of things that we are not supposed to do. And I say, uh, we say about it, well, we can do that. I can do that. I can avoid those things. But then at the last, God requires inward obedience as well. We have to fix our heart and our attitude. Just like we've mentioned before with the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins with those actions that the Pharisees are doubtless able to keep. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. The Pharisees go, well, I haven't committed adultery, so I must be righteous. And then Jesus goes, but wait a minute, now I say to you, if you've even looked on a woman with lust, then you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. And all of a sudden, the Pharisee is firmly back in the sinner category. And it's because of the intents of his heart. We can keep the outward commandments, but can we keep the inner ones? Those are much harder. And all of that, the entire Sermon on the Mount, the entire teaching on the Ten Commandments is intended to have us despair of our own righteousness and to flee to Christ. We're intended to see the wretchedness of our own condition and to cling to the cross instead. This is what is intended in bringing these things to our attention. It's not just so that we try harder. We say, well, I'll just will myself. To do better. No. Instead we say I can't do this on my own. What am I going to do? And Jesus comes along and says stop striving. And depend on me. Martin Luther says about the tenth, tenth commandment. This last commandment then is addressed not to those whom the world considered wicked rogues but to precisely to the most upright, to people who wish to be commended as honest and virtuous because they've not offended against the preceding commandments. We often consider Paul the super apostle, the one who had it all together on this earth. He was a scrupulous keeper of the moral law as a Jew. Listen to what he says in Romans. I wouldn't not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. And he finishes that chapter by crying out, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death. And his final words, but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, and in the words of the opening of chapter 8, verse 1, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Again, we are to flee to Christ when we despair in our own selves of having the righteousness it takes to see God. Here's what Francis Schaeffer had to say about the words of Paul. Thou shalt not covet is the internal commandment which shows the man who thinks himself to be moral that he really needs a savior. The average moral man who have lived comparing himself to other men, comparing himself to a rather easy list of rules, can feel like Paul that he's getting along all right. But suddenly when he's confronted with the inward command not to covet, he's brought to his knees. Again, I believe this is why the commandment is the very, the very, possibly the hardest one to keep. Is because it 
begins in the heart. And our hearts often tell a different story than our actions. We may be obedient on the outside and have rebellion on the inside. One of the instructive things about the Word of God is that there's always a story about the very thing we're talking about, at least where it regards the Ten Commandments. It's been true, a commandment's given. There's a story about someone who didn't keep that commandment. There's always details about what became of this person. The most impactful story about the sin of covetousness comes to us from the book of 1 Kings in chapter 21. It's the story of King Ahab. One of his subjects named Naboth. It certainly seems to be no lack of kings in the Old Testament who were covetous. But Ahab really takes the cake for his attitudes and his actions. When the author of 1 Kings begins the narrative about the reign of King Ahab over Israel, one of the first things that he says about him is that out of all of the kings, he's the one who did the worst of all things. Of all the sinners, he's the biggest sinner. The first couple of verses in chapter 21 tell us that Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard so that I can make a vegetable garden out of it. Ahab offered to buy the vineyard and give Naboth some other land instead. This vineyard was located in Samaria. And it says that it was outside of the palace of King Ahab there in Samaria. Now bear in mind, Ahab also had a palace in Jerusalem. Gives you an idea of kind of how he thought about things. But now he also has this one in Samaria. And outside of this palace is the vineyard of Naboth. And Ahab decides that he wants it. But you have to understand, a sovereign of Israel had limited options where it regarded just seizing property. He couldn't do that. God made it clear that the the property all belonged to him in Scripture. And so the kings couldn't just go in and take it. Further, Naboth was prohibited from selling his father's land by the civil laws of God. And so Naboth was guarding his property. He was obeying God. And that made him at odds with the king of Israel. Not a great place to be. This was especially true if the the king was as wicked as Ahab was. And so, what does Ahab do when Naboth tells him no? Well, he pouts. Verse 4 and following of 1 Kings 21 say this, So Ahab came into his house sullen and vexed because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and ate no food. (laughs) Now, there's some pretty serious instances of self-pity in Scripture. There's some doozies of a pity party that happen. But there's no pity party that even compares to this pity party right here. Naboth, he won't give me any land for my vegetables. So I'm going to pout. And I'm going to make it obvious that I'm not getting what I want. And so along comes the queen, Queen Jezebel. And yes, this is the same Jezebel that gets bad press these days. She's the one that made up her face so big at the end. We call someone a Jezebel these days for dressing shamefully or wearing too much makeup. And the queen, Jezebel says to Ahab, are are you not the king? Are you not sovereign? Why are you laying around pouting? She says to him, get up, wash your face, eat something. I will see to it that you get your vineyard. 
mean, this whole story is just so pitiful. He's depending now on his wife. He sends his wife to sick Naboth to get him what he wants. He can't get it himself, so she's going to get it for him. And so she tells some men, you need to declare a fast. And during this fast, you need to set Naboth at the head of his people, make him very prominent during this fast, and, and then have two worthless men come and make charges against him. The men need to say, Naboth cursed God and cursed the king. And so, just like they were told to do, the fast was declared. Naboth was set over the people. The men came in and falsely accused Naboth. Now, remember last week we told you that in the commandment, someone had to have more than one witness before they would be able to, to be convicted. Jezebel made sure Naboth had two witnesses against him. And so, he was convicted of these false charges that were trumped up against him. As a result, what happened was everyone took Naboth outside of the city and they stoned him to death. Now God, of course, saw everything that happened. And so he told Elijah, the God's prophet during that time, Elijah, he said, Elijah, go to Ahab and you tell him that his blood is going to run in the same place that Naboth's ran. You tell him he is a dead man for doing what he did. Tell him also that Jezebel is going to be eaten by the dogs. So Elijah told the king (laughs) what God said, and I bet his knees were shaking. Sure enough, Ahab went into battle a while later, and a random arrow was shot up into the air, and guess where it landed? Right in Ahab's chest. Someone randomly shoots up into the air, and this random arrow found its way inside of Ahab. Now, what are the odds? Well, if God says so, they're 100%, aren't they? <laughs> and they washed the blood out from his chariot after it was all said and done into the very spot where Naboth died. And then not long after this, Jezebel was thrown from the window of the palace in an act of judgment. And when they went to scoop her up to bury her, they found her skull, a little bit of her feet, and the palms of her hands. The rest of her had been eaten up by wild dogs. I'm not saying you're going to be eaten up by wild dogs if you're covetous, but covetousness can cost us everything that is dear to us in our lives. Sometimes we'll find ourselves guilty of saying the words, if only, if only, if only I had this car, if only I had this wife, if only I had a decent football team to root for. Really, really rare these days, isn't it? Those words remind me actually of a lullaby that's sung in one of my favorite movies, Holes, you may have seen. It says, if only, if only, the woodpecker sighs, the bark on the tree was as soft as the skies. As the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, he cries to the moon, if only, if only. The lullaby is about not being happy with our lot in life. The woodpecker's wanting softer wood to peck. The wolf's below wishing he could get at the woodpecker for food, and no one is satisfied with where they are. And this really is the key to all of this today. Just as there's a prohibition in the Tenth Commandment, we must ask, as Francis Schaeffer asked, how shall we then live? And the answer is in contentment. Contentment is the positive action to offset the sin of covetousness. The truth of the matter is if God intended for us to have more than we have, we'll have more. If we needed different spiritual gifts than the ones that we possess in order to best glorify God, then he would provide those gifts for us. If we needed more money, God would make sure that we had more money. 
the wisdom of Solomon comes into play here in Ecclesiastes. He tells us, one who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor one who loves abundance with its income. This too is futility. You might say, Lord, couldn't I just be like Solomon and at least have the chance to find out if money would make me miserable? Please? There are a couple of other great verses and passages about contentment. They're both from Paul, who, you know, Paul really ran the gamut of situations in life, came from a well-to-do family, was well off, and, and then, you know, he suffered so much need at some points in his life. He said to Timothy, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. We have food and covering with these. We shall be content. There's a great theologian named Don Henley. Perhaps you've heard of him. Sings for a band called the Eagles. He wrote a song called Give Me What You Got. And it says in there, I ain't seen no hearses with luggage racks. That's good theology. The other passage that's so great related to godly contentment is in Philippians 4. You're so familiar with this. Paul's writing from a prison cell, as he often did. And he says this, Not that I speak from need, for I've learned to be content. In whatever circumstances I am, I know how to get along with little. I also know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The word of God is so very alive to us. It still speaks to me every single week that I study it. I was just talking to Peggy about this this past week. When I was a little boy, I memorized Philippians 4.11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned. So it's been in my psyche, my, my consciousness for a really long time. I've always been aware of, of Philippians 4.13, what it says as well. But just this past week, it hit me that the context of this passage is related to godly contentment. And you might say, well, duh, Pastor Dan. Let me explain what I mean, though. You very often see, and you've seen it, Philippians 4.13 quoted, referenced in times of someone wanting to do something great in their lives. For example, you may see an athlete have it printed on their shoes at the Super Bowl. Philippians 4.13, it's right there on their shoes. Or you may see someone reference it in relationship to going to the Olympics. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But have you ever stopped to consider that that's taking this verse out of context? It is. That verse is not about doing great things for God. This verse was written by a man in prison for his faith. About being content in his present circumstances. It's not about setting the world on fire for God. It's about surviving. I can win the Olympics for God, we say. Great. Now, could you be content if you had a career-ending injury and you were sidelined and you had to watch your team compete on TV? Could you do that and not have any bitterness, no covetousness in your heart? Can you be happy and content when your world is crashing around you? That's the context of the verse, not being a world beater. And this is good for us to remember. We need to practice the discipline of godly contentment. And I say it in that fashion because it is a discipline. It's a discipline. It's not natural and it's not easy. If it was natural and easy, then why is Christianity so incredibly eaten up with materialism? Why are Christians so consumed with having earthly wealth? 
It's not natural to be content, but it's commanded here in this passage. We brought nothing into this world and we will take nothing out. And if God is gracious and he allows some some things for us in the in-between of all of this, we will be grateful and we will rejoice like Paul did. Can we rejoice like Job did when everything was taken from him? He had a list of stuff that he had, so much stuff, and it was all taken. And it says that in all of that, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. He said the Lord gave and the Lord took away. And blessed be the name of the Lord. I suspect that if most of you are like me, if God takes things away, my tendency is to act more like Ahab and less like Job. I turn my face to the wall and I pout. This whole thing of honoring God in our hearts is a bridge too far. We can do all the actions. We can keep from doing all of the actions. But our attitude while we're doing or not doing can be horrendous. And I speak from experience. A few years ago, through a set of circumstances that were not my own doing, I tell you, church I lost my joy of service I had it and it, then it was just gone in my heart I despised every single thing that I did for the church and it was related to the fact that I look around me and, and many of the people who, uh, who were supposed to be serving beside me were just on a picnic holiday they were I was making them look good, and they were coming out smelling like a rose, and I resented it with every fiber of my being, and so my joy of service had just been sucked dry because I had forgotten. I wasn't doing what I was doing for them. I forgot I wasn't doing it so they would look good and I got no attention. I wasn't doing it because others would recognize just how much I was doing and how little others were doing. I was supposed to be doing these things with a grateful heart toward God and I just wasn't. My contentment had gone out the window. And I'll be honest, I had a monster of a time getting it back. I did. In fact, still today, some of those feelings rear their ugly head in me. I forgot that godliness with contentment was great gain. I had the actions part down pat, or perhaps I should say I had the acting part down pat. I was acting. I was acting like a good Christian when in fact my heart was rotten in all of that. I had to be reminded. And I'm grateful that God allows second chances and third chances and when we're so insufferable in his presence. Contentment was what was lacking. Not action, not the leaving off of sinful things. It was my heart. And friend, your heart and the condition of your heart the attitude with which you do things counts just as much as if I had left off doing them altogether. If I'd thrown up my hands and quit, I would not have been in more sin. Our hearts matter. What we think about matters. What fills our waking thoughts matter just as much as we conduct our, ourselves, perhaps even more. We sing that song here, he is jealous for me, not jealous of me, jealous for me. And if my Savior is jealous for me, I should be jealous for him as well, jealous for his good name, jealous that he is glorified above all. Any envy in me ought to be envy for his fame. He should be famous. It's One of my favorite all-time verses, just this little bitty blurb, from John the Baptist in John chapter 3 when he says he must increase and I must decrease. 
My wants and my dreams need to take a back seat to what he wants for me, what he dreams for me, because that's the only reality anyway. What he dreams for us is what comes true. And let me tell you something. If it's to be a beggar in the street, it would hold more honor and it would be better for me eternally than to be the new king of England. We're called to be content. Not just mere contentment, not, a, not just a complacency that perhaps seeks to never amount to much. We're called to a godly contentment that says, whatever you have for me, God, whatever it is, that is what is good. Whatever you call me to, I will do it. And I will do it with not just contentment, but with joy. With joy. Because the only true and lasting joy is found in you, Lord. We may often find ourselves restless in this life. We may find ourselves prone to be discontent. My prayer today as we close, would match up with what Augustine prayed many, many centuries ago, back in the 5th century of Christianity, and close with this. He said, you've made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they can find rest in you. Let's pray together. And Father, may we de develop the discipline of godly contentment. Father, may we find that it invades our lives at every turn. And Lord, that we would never once be desiring of things that don't belong to us or things that would not be good for us. Thank you for being a good God, a giving God, Lord, a God that gives us all good things, Lord, supplies us with all of our needs. And, Lord, even some of our wants sometimes, Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.